We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Chris, I think it's over to you now. I, I thank you very much. I, I, <laughs> as Ali, I was waiting for a cue, but I, I'm, here I am. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris de Spain, and I am moderating this session. Uh, welcome to the main session on Trust Matters, exploring ways of building a safe and secure cyberspace. Um, there have been many sessions at this IGF in, in the trust theme uh, on things like online voting, on net neutrality, encryption, then privacy. And back in November, uh, there was a preparatory session for this session. And, and our goal uh, for this particular session is to build on that preparatory session. And so this is how it's going to run. Um, in, in order for us to build on it, the first thing we need to do is to take stock of what happened at the preparatory session. Uh, and a summary of that is going to be given to us by uh, Shizok Kumar. Then we're going to go to Ambassador Henri Verdier and Interpol Cybercrime Director Craig Jones, who will uh, address their perspectives on the, on the major trends. That'll be followed by a couple of case studies, one from Josephine Ballon from HateAid and one from Rasha Abdulrahim from Amnesty International. And then we'll move to our discussants. Uh, Bart Grujus, Anastasia Kasakova, Lazaredi, uh, Dr. Catherine Guitar, and Liesl France, and I apologize in advance for any mangling I've done of those names. Um, and they are going to talk about their views on the main trends, the different approaches to uh, reaching trust, the roles of the different stakeholders, and what role uh, the IGF can play. And then uh, at some point during that discussion, We'll move to questions from the floor and from uh, and online, um, and we'll wrap it up uh, in about ninety minutes' time. So, thank you all for being here. Let's get going, and I'll throw it first to Shital, who's going to give us the uh, summary of the preparatory session. Shital, over to you. Thanks so much, Chris, and it's great to be here, especially uh, seeing so many people on on the last day of the IGF. Um, it's really great. So, uh, yes, my task is to provide you with an overview of the discussion we had at the preparatory session where a few key themes were discussed and some challenges were discussed and some recommendations were provided. So uh, my aim is to go through the key takeaways, um, which are focused around the need for collaboration uh, and also discussed cyber norms and cyber crime and uh, share with you some of the challenges that were discussed and some of the recommendations to end. So first on collaboration, it was noted that it's very important to build on existing efforts amongst different communities and link them up together. Uh, it was also noted that the issue of resources first and political will uh, can, doesn't always match up with actual need and um, that there may be challenges with regards to possible centralization of networks and their, that impact, um, the impact of that on, on cybersecurity going forward. The example of certs and security researchers working together, especially in a voluntary capacity often, was highlighted as an example of cybersecurity cooperation. And it was, it was said that this cooperation not only extends to information sharing, but also to capacity building and that these communities do, do a lot of that too. And that it's really important uh, for these initiatives to not only be expanded, um, but to, to do that with, with the continued support of other stakeholders as well. So that was collaboration. And then on norms, uh, what the, the key message was really that uh, we, we need a deeper understanding of cyber norms and, and how they're working and how they're not. And the point was that to make norms uh, work, this requires continuous discussion and effort um, for, for deepening the understanding by the multi-stakeholder community about, about how um, cyber norms work, 
um, those adopted by, by the UN, the 11 cyber norms, what leads to success and failure in cyber norm implementation, as well as in the, the need to engage new actors continuously. So it was said that the discussion of the IGF should focus on the implementation of agreed cyber norms. And I just wanted to point out that the Best Practice Forum on Cybersecurity, which will be hosting its session after this, directly after this, has played a key role in this regard over the past few years. And, and this year, it's taken a really interesting deep dive into cyber norms. So I do really encourage you to come to that. And then on cybercrime, it was noted that cyber Crime discussions require technical and policy solutions supported across the multi-stakeholder community and that governments need to take greater responsibility for criminal activity originating within their borders, even if the ultimate victims are elsewhere. However, it was also said and, and reinforced by many that combating cybercrime should, should not include stifling political speech or dissent or other forms of free expression online. And that any new cybercrime treaty referring to the UN process currently underway in the third committee should focus on ensuring effective exchange of information, performing mutual legal assistance processes and finding ways to address uh, cyber criminality and not seek to to undermine rights or, or seek to redefine or address what has already been addressed in existing agreements. So that was some areas of key takeaways on those three, three themes, collaboration, norms, and cybercrime. Onto challenges, and um, before I quickly look at recommendations that came from that session. So on challenges, it was said that from, from African and many developing country perspectives, several issues need to be addressed um, because despite treaties on cybercrime and conventions, some of which have not been ratified by, by many of these countries, there are continued challenges relating to capacity building, which includes lack of willingness to allocate resources for capacity building, poor participation, lack of follow-up post-capacity building exercises, or lack of opportunities to actually put in practice what was, what was taught, and that these need to be addressed at the higher level. And then other challenges include the affordability of security, lack of security budgets, again, lack of resources, and the capability of small businesses and governments, increasing threats of nation state actors when dealing with cybersecurity incidents, and the issue of attribution was also highlighted. Um, so the increased cost for combating cybercrime links in with all of that, the, the increasing need for tools um, and, and necessary um, uh, legal frameworks for enforcement were also highlighted. And then some other challenges related to data governance and the challenges in um, data flow owing to national regulations and need to involve different stakeholders in discussions related to data governance issues. And finally, on challenges, it was noted that while, while most narratives related to the encryption discussions are focused around big tech companies, there are medium-sized tech companies that are deeply affected by these issues as well. And then on to recommendations, a need to formulate a better approach to deal with existing cybersecurity challenges was highlighted. Um, it was highlighted that while it is generally accepted that cybersecurity cooperation and capacity building is needed, a review of what has worked and what has not worked in different contexts is necessary. Uh, then on capacity building, it was suggested that this should not be limited to training, but extended to mentoring, sharing information, inviting people to join different communities, and collaborating to address issues, identifying and linking existing efforts to one another. So, for example, linking tabletop exercises run by corporates or states to work being done by certain networks, like FIRST. And now on the issue of encryption, was highlighted that there is a need to get into the specificity of, of issues such as who is implicated, how is strong encryption defined. And finally, it was said that stakeholders um, need to own implementation and um, identify solutions that range from mitigation to training to support implementation of norms and standards into their own products. So that's it for me. Um, I hope you agree. It was a really rich discussion. A lot came out of that. And I'm looking forward to, to hearing what everyone else has to say today to build on that. Thanks so much, Chris. Thank you, Shital. That was a really in interesting summary of the, of the prep discussion. And I have a feeling we might be coming back to you uh, 
with some for some reference points when we when we get into discussion. So so don't go away. Not that you were going to, but but don't. Um, okay, we're going to move on to uh, looking at some of the main trends now. And the first person I'm going to call on is Ambassador Henri Vernier, uh, who's going to talk to us about his perspectives with the major trends. Over to you, Henri. Bonjour. Hey. Bonjour à tous. Bonsoir. Bonne nuit. Je crois qu'on peut faire une spéciale dédicace à nos amis qui sont du Texas ou de DC et pour qui il est 3 heures du matin. Et puis je, je salue les, les traducteurs parce que c'est eux qui font vivre le, la francophonie et la diversité culturelle dans nos débats et, et je trouve ça très précieux. Je suis également heureux ce matin de vous parler en français. Euh, et merci beaucoup de, de l'invitation et de m'offrir la première prise de parole. Je voudrais commencer par une idée simple, mais qu'on n'entend plus suffisamment. Internet, parce qu'il était décentralisé, parce qu'il est neutre, parce qu'il est libre et ouvert, a ouvert un cycle d'innovation sans précédent, un cycle de démocratie, d'intelligence collective, de création, d'accès à la culture, d'accès à l'éducation, de développement économique. Et aujourd'hui, nous avons à faire face à des difficultés qu'il va falloir résoudre. Mais je crois, nous croyons, la France, l'Europe et beaucoup d'entre nous à l'IGF, que nous devons trouver les solutions dans ces mêmes principes qui nous ont apporté 50 ans d'innovation et de croissance. Euh, et qu'il ne faut pas contester ce modèle euh, initial, mais au contraire le, le remettre au centre du débat. Les menaces auxquelles nous avons à faire face, euh, je dis souvent qu'il y en a trois et parfois quatre. Euh, la première, ne l'oublions pas parce qu'elle est là quand même, c'est le trop grand déséquilibre. Si quelques entreprises une, rares ou, ou quelques États rares ont un quasi-monopole de l'intelligence artificielle, de la capacité de chiffrement ou que sais-je, nous aurons un Internet déséquilibré et nous serons menacés. Le deuxième, vous venez d'en parler beaucoup dans le résumé, Chital, c'est la, la weaponization, c'est les acteurs malveillants qui apprennent à utiliser le numérique contre la paix ou contre la sécurité. Alors, on a de très grandes questions de cybersécurité, et puis, on a des questions de manipulation de l'information. Et ces acteurs sont, la plupart d'entre eux, criminels. Mais parfois, on trouve des acteurs étatiques ou protégés par les États. Et c'est inquiétant. Et puis, j'ai envie de dire, il y a quand même une troisième série de problèmes. On pourrait les appeler les externalités négatives. On voit maintenant que les business models ou les algorithmes de certaines entreprises génèrent des externalités négative. Euh, c'est pas grave, on va les corriger. On a eu d'autres problèmes euh, avec l'industrie et l'environnement ou avec... Euh, voilà, c'est pas la seule industrie qui génère des problèmes, mais il faudra les résoudre. Et je disais qu'on a peut-être quatre menaces parce qu'évidemment, face à ces dangers, si les États réagissent de manière euh, autoritaire, euh, centralisée, euh, en prétendant réguler seuls, bah, ils, ils se révéleront la, la quatrième menace sur cet Internet libre et ouvert. Donc, il s'agit de trouver des réponses qui respectent la diversité, le multistakeholderisme, la transparence, l'intelligence collective et le, la neutralité d'Internet et, et sa liberté. Euh, la France s'est engagée dans cette voie avec force. Vous ne le savez peut-être pas, mais dès les premières semaines de son mandat, le président Macron a prononcé un grand discours sur l'Europe euh, où il a dit euh, en 2017, le discours de la Sorbonne, où il a dit que l'Europe devait définir un cadre de régulation numérique pour ne pas subir la, voie, la loi du plus fort. Et c'était une idée importante, euh, pour son propre compte, bien sûr, pour le compte de l'Europe. Et puis, vous vous en souvenez peut-être, en 2018, euh, nous avons accueilli l'Internet Governance Forum et le président a insisté sur la nécessité de construire euh, par la régulation c'est une voie nouvelle où les États, avec les acteurs de l'Internet, les sociétés civiles et l'ensemble des acteurs, arrivent à bien réguler 
Et euh, il avait précisé, je, je le cite aujourd'hui, que cette régulation, euh, nous espérions que les géants de la technologie euh, y contribueraient, mais que sinon, elle se ferait avec ou sans eau. Et depuis, nous avons ouvert ce, plusieurs, de, de nombreux chantiers avec nombre d'entre vous, puisque précisément, nous, nous sommes à la recherche, avec, nos, avec de très nombreux acteurs, mais nous sommes à la recherche d'un multi-stakeholderisme efficace. Alors, euh, nombre d'entre vous en font partie. Vous avez peut-être vu, par exemple, que nous avons lancé l'appel de Paris pour la confiance et la sécurité dans le cyberespace, qui a été rejoint il y a trois semaines et nous en étions très heureux par les États-Unis et par la Commission européenne. Et nous sommes maintenant 1200 acteurs, 80 États, plus de 700 entreprises, plus de 350 organisations de la société civile. Et nous travaillons ensemble sur les principes d'une sécurité durable. Et ce qui m'a personnellement beaucoup intéressé dans ce projet, c'est qu'au fond, les DSI, des grands groupes industriels, les chercheurs, ils nous ont dit, le travail que vous avez fait depuis 20 ans en diplomatie sur les normes et sur le droit international est essentiel, mais il n'est pas suffisant. Il va falloir construire de la « security by design », si je puis me permettre. Il va falloir que les entreprises trouvent des normes de bonne pratique. Il va falloir financer réellement la montée en capacité des États qui en font la demande. Il va falloir que la recherche s'entende sur des règles de divulgation responsables des failles. Et ils nous ont signalé tout un ensemble de, de mesures qui, qui, qui allaient dans le sens de, de construire une plus grande résilience d'Internet et pas seulement d'interdire les mauvais comportements. Alors, fort de cette initiative, nous, nous travaillons beaucoup ensemble dans l'appel de Paris. Vous avez vu que nous avons publié des... Six, les résultats de six groupes de travail euh, il y a trois semaines, mais nous nous sommes sentis mandatés pour proposer à l'ONU de créer au sein des Nations Unies un programme of action, un programme d'action pour que les Nations Unies, d'une manière inclusive et incluant euh, toutes les parties prenantes, disposent d'un outil permettant de mettre en œuvre ces politiques de sécurité par la résilience et nous allons, aujourd'hui, nous sommes déjà 54 États à proposer ce POA, mais nous allons travailler toute l'année pour convaincre les autres et nous espérons le proposer à la prochaine Assemblée générale des Nations unies. Je vais être plus court, mais nous avons traité de la même manière la question de la gestion des contenus terroristes après la, la, la terrible attaque des mosquées à Christchurch avec la Nouvelle-Zélande et puis rapidement une dizaine d'États et des grandes entreprises et de très nombreuses organisations de la société civile nous avons réfléchi sur les manières de, de retirer les contenus terroristes sans délai et dans le respect de l'état de droit, dans le respect d'une exigence de transparence, de règles qui soient les mêmes pour tous, de responsabilité, de accountability les uns devant les autres. Et nous avons prototypé comme ça des protocoles de crise et, et un fonctionnement qui en particulier a permis de nourrir les travaux en Europe de la régulation européenne sur les retraites de contenus terroristes mais qui est une communauté, le Christchurch Call, qui, qui va bien au-delà de l'Europe et, et qui permet un travail renouvelé avec euh, les entreprises et la société civile. Euh, de même, nous avons soutenu l'initiative, de. alors là je passe sur les, la question des fake news, des disinformation, nous soutenons fortement l'initiative de Reporters sans frontières, euh, le Forum pour l'information et, et la démocratie, parce que là aussi, nous pensons que, bien sûr, il faut euh, démonter les réseaux de faux comptes, repérer les deepfakes et les propagations euh, par des robots. C'est très important. Mais si nous ne veillons pas à préserver l'information de qualité, à s'assurer que les journalistes aient l'indépendance politique et économique, à s'assurer que l'information de qualité ait un avantage compétitif, qu'elle soit repérable... Eh bien, le travail pour lutter contre la désinformation ne sera pas suffisant. Donc là encore, nous avons rejoint une coalition multi-acteurs au service de, de, cette, de cette ambition. Je, je pourrais continuer, mais je crois qu'il est plus intéressant d'aller assez vite au débat. Je voulais juste vous citer un dernier petit projet parce que nous y sommes très attachés. Euh, si nous voulons vraiment que ces régulations se fassent 
Dans le respect de l'état de droit, euh, il faudra de la transparence, il faudra de la connaissance. Et en particulier, un sujet qui est cher au, au cœur de mon équipe, c'est le fait que nous vivons de facto aujourd'hui dans un cadre juridique qui sont les conditions générales d'utilisation des entreprises, les « terms of services » et qu'il est presque impossible de les comprendre tellement il y en a et tellement ils changent souvent. Et donc, nous essayons de lancer un, un digital common, un, un commun numérique contributif, et nous faisons appel à toutes les communautés de bonne volonté qui veulent se joindre à nous. C'est l'Open Terms Archive. Nous pensons, est, je viens de mettre le lien là dans le chat, nous pensons qu'il est nécessaire que nous ayons tous Société civile, entreprise, chercheurs en sciences juridiques, État, régulateur, une capacité de comprendre et d'analyser euh, la manière dont les content policies, les privacy policies et, et toutes ces choses si importantes sont réellement traitées dans les terms of services des entreprises et dont elles évoluent. Et donc, nous avons fait cet outil qui permet à chacun d'analyser tout ça, d'analyser les évolutions et nous avons commencé avec quelques alliés, notamment l'association TOSBAC. Et pour l'instant, nous avons 700 contrats, mais il en faut des milliers et des milliers. Et nous espérons que d'autres communautés vont se joindre au mouvement et nous aider. Voilà, donc c'était juste pour vous dire, euh, nous avons créé ensemble, toutes nos communautés, cet Internet extraordinaire. Il y a des difficultés, mais il n'y a pas de raison de ne pas considérer que nous pouvons régler ces difficultés avec les mêmes principes qui ont fait le succès d'Internet depuis 50 ans. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Henri. Um, that's excellent. And thank you for the link. Um, no doubt everybody will be actively pursuing that once we finish this session. Um, we're going to go now to uh, to Craig Jones, who is the uh, Cybercrime Director of Interpol, and Craig is going to give us his perspectives on the on the major trends. Craig, over to you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Chris, and uh, welcome to everybody. So, from Interpol's perspective, um, if we look at the current threat picture, Craig, 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 Craig sorry, it's Chris. Up to you, but uh, your video is turned off at the moment. Ah, sorry. There we go. Now we can see you. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much. So as Interpol, then, we, we look at the current threat picture through a national, regional and global lens and dependent on the sector and community being impacted. Um, we also see the maturity of digitalisation or connectivity playing into this as well. We've seen this going way beyond the borders, and we all, we, we've spoken about that at length, but we've certainly seen now that the recent shift towards governments, businesses, and key infrastructure, and even hospitals. The criminal use of information communications technology poses a formidable challenge to security worldwide, and also inhibits the potential of digital economies. As we're saying, much of this has been discussed over the last few days here at the IGF. Recognising the magnitude of the problem, Interpol plays a key role in addressing cybercrime on a global scale in support of our 195 member countries. Our most recent assessment underlined that during the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond, it opened up new avenues for cybercriminals to carry out various forms of online crime, again regardless of the region. We saw the prominent threats, again, the ransomware-based extortions, business email compromise, cyber and phone-based frauds, illegal data harvesting operations and also misinformation. And then we saw the re-emergence of older types of malware repurposed to take advantage of a global pandemic. So the cyber threat landscape in the past year has exponentially growth in the scale and impact of these threats as criminals and fraudsters have been exploiting fundamental social needs and continuation of anxieties in the cyberspace during the COVID-19 pandemic. We've received numerous requests from member countries to address ransomware attacks against hospitals and other health institutions uh, who were on the front line in the fight against coronavirus since March 2020. And again, this was covered in a session very well yesterday. By attacking these critical infrastructures, criminals have been shown their will and power to maximise both the damage for their targets, but more importantly, for their own financial gain. We know ransomware attacks are not new, but they are the fastest growing form of reported cybercrime. 
ransomware provides a highly enticing and lucrative business model for cyber criminals with the use of multiple extortions and the ransomware as a service models. These attacks are not always sector specific, but they are financially motivated with the financial gains being channeled through virtual currency networks. While the need for physical money mule networks has reduced in part to the pandemic and restrictions in travels, the criminals have adjusted the business model and the changes globally and regionally. Indeed, they've made the criminal enterprise more efficient and effective by being early adopters of the technology. In addition, we've seen complex cyber frauds hitting victims in Europe and proceeds being routed as far as West Africa and Southeast Asia within hours. Data breaches also continue to incur, causing significant financial loss and impact to businesses. At the same time, cyber criminals are hiding in the dark net that can provide anonymous and untraceable access. The convergence between cyber and financial crime is posing a complex challenge. This entails multiple phases ranging from cyber attacks to data exploitation and then to money laundering phases of layering and eventual cashing out. The use of virtual and cryptocurrency in this process can also hinder effective and timely response. Given the complexity, a joint operation model is required, combining the capabilities of different specialised units in law enforcement to better combat cyber-enabled fraud and money laundering. To offer the full array of operational analytical support in this regard, Interpol launched the Global Financial Crimes Task Force for Law Enforcement at the end of 2020. And within Interpol's Global Cybercrime Programme, we're striking to address these challenges through providing regional threat assessments, Recently, 2021, we published one on Africa and also for the ASEAN region. We're looking at the regional model for operational coordination, and this is setting up of regional desks, and this is being built. Trust, though, is crucial. We need to go beyond the geopolitical boundaries that are being followed. As a neutral organisation, Interpol developed school platforms for communications amongst all of our 195 countries for law enforcement, but also for private partners as well. We need to induce that trust in technology. We have a successful legal framework for information sharing with our private sector partners and again inducing that trust legally. Our model is reinforcing people, process and technology to deliver the global programme in combating cybercrime. So just a few of the lessons that we've learnt. There's a different role of law enforcement, a more international than local and national in combating cybercrime. Taking a multi-stakeholder approach and working closely with private partners, international organisations, NGOs and the CERT communities. Rethinking how we build out the policing model to protect life and property and prevent crime in the era of digitalisation. Technology can help by learning safe behaviours, but we need to build with security by design as well. And also, what are the effective deterrents? Is it only about arresting? or disrupting the criminal business model. It is important to know where and how they operate in cyberspace to, in order to achieve this. Law enforcement does not always have the resources nationally or internationally to operate within this space. And my final point is this session, trust. It has to be built within the law enforcement community. We again follow those geopolitical lines and boundaries. Interpol is finding a better response collectively with the private sector, first responders and other international organisations. But we need to continue to build on that trust model within the online community. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, I'll hand it back to you. Thanks, Craig. And, and, and uh, we can see you, see you sitting up there on your, on your own on that, on that stage and wish, wish we were there with you. Um, well done on making it. T 10 points to you, that's what I say. Um, and we'll come back to you later on um, uh, to, to, to ask some questions about the about the, the, the points that you've raised. Right, so we're going to move on now to to a, a couple of couple of case studies, and the first one is going to come from uh, Josephine Bannell. And Josephine, I think if, if I'm not mistaken, you have some some slides that you wanted to use. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Um, thank you very much. I will just share my screen for a little presentation. Um, I will approach a topic from a quite specific um, civil society point of view, which is the view of the victims of online violence. Um, these are the people that we are taking care of with our organization. So, 
Yes, uh, we are Hate Aid, and I'm the head of legal at Hate Aid, um, and we represent the interests of the victims of online violence. We offer counseling to those affected from online violence. We give them like a first aid package to uh, um, provide emotional support, and we also offer cybersecurity counseling um, since yeah, secure passports and also the question which personal information can and should be found um, about me online has become very, very relevant um, in our um, in our world um, that is taking place a lot on the internet and on social media platforms. Uh, we also offer communication counseling in order to uh, um, help the victims deal with the situation and help them to, yeah, to find out what is the right um, reaction in their specific situation right now. We also um, have a strong interest in law enforcement, uh, which includes criminal complaints, but also litigation um, financing um, that we offer against the online platforms, but also directly uh, to the perpetrators. And uh, we, of course, offer help in legally secure documentation of hate speech incidents, um, as this can also be a challenge for the victims already. Um, and, of course, as every NGO, <clears throat> we also have a strong interest in creating awareness and yeah, we see ourselves as the attorneys uh, for those affected um, in the debate. So why is it that an organization like ours is needed? And I have to say that um, HeyDeck was founded around three years ago. And since then, we consulted more than 1,500 people in Germany and supported more than 150 with litigation financing. Um, and we are still uh, the only nationwide consultation center in uh, Germany. Um, so we are still quite unique uh, with what we are doing. Um, why we are needed? Um, the question is quite easy because all these things have become normal on social media. We see hate speech, we see uh, um, insults and defamation in the commentary sections of social media. We see that activists, journalists and politicians, especially on a local, uh, on a local level, are very vulnerable on the internet these days. Uh, we see that young women receive um, dick pics um, like all the time uh, when we look at young activists or influencers um, this has become really common but we also see that personal information is misused and misused a lot to harass people and to uh, not even insult them but also to intimidate them and really scare them and we even had cases where people had to move because their personal address um, landed on the internet and it was just not possible um, to remove it entirely and make sure that they are safe and we also see that the misuse of pictures and even the manipulation of pictures um, this is not always nudes, but um, all different kinds of pictures uh, plays a huge role also in the setting up of fake profiles and the spread of lies about people. So these are yeah, mainly covering uh, the main topics that we are dealing with and that people reach out um, to us with. Um, we see that especially marginalized groups um, reach out to us and that also intersectionality plays a huge role here. So the more, um, yeah, the more um, uh, the more uh, criteria uh, that comes together, the most likely it is that you will be attacked on the internet. But we see especially that people that speak up for our democratic values on the internet are in specific dangers, which, which is journalists, activists, politicians, and everybody uh, who wants to express their opinion on the internet. Online violence is everywhere. Um, now, this is something that we have to be aware of. We conducted a survey in Europe um, and found out that in the European Union, 60% of the users overall have witnessed online violence already. And in, with the young adults, it was 91% of the users that has become a victim of online violence and uh, that has witnessed online violence. And we saw that 50% of the um, young adults um, that were asked uh, have become a victim already. So it's every second young adult that is, uh, has been a victim of online violence in the past. Although it looks like now everybody is very, very hateful and is just spreading um, this, this hate on the internet um, constantly, it's actually not the case because the, the um, amount of people who is spreading all this online violence is actually quite small. This is what many studies have found out now, but they understood very well how to manipulate the algorithms of, uh, of the online world and how to 
um, also use the electronic means to be very, very effective with what they are doing. Um, there was a study conducted that found out that in the hateful commentary sections of Facebook, for example, it was only 5% of the users that were responsible for 50% of the likes to hateful con uh, content. We also did a, a, a smaller study um, with regards to the German elections that we just had and found out that uh, in some major shit shitstorms that yeah, some politicians experienced, uh, we saw that um, there were more than 4,000 comments that could be uh, broken down uh, to only about 200 accounts um, that were spreading all this hate. The problem of all this is that not only the victims are intimidated and they will think about it twice if they want to post something on social media, if they want to participate in a public debate where, um, that, that takes place on the internet uh, mainly these days, um, we see that it's also the bystanders, the people watching what's happening there, that are just uh, becoming a witness, um, start to withdraw from the public debate and do no longer express their political opinions, but also other opinions. Um, we see that from study to study, um, this does not lo uh, not longer make that much of a difference. And we see that people change their behavior on the internet and do no longer participate, which creates uh, a very weird bubble where the very few that are very loud and aggressive um, seem to be the majority of people and seem to represent the majority uh, um, opinion um, of our society. And we are convinced that this is a real threat to freedom of speech and a threat to our democracy that has to be considered in the debate about how online privacy um, should work and how we should you know, we want to design our internet. We have to make sure that the internet is a safe space for both sides of the spectrum of uh, freedom, of freedom of expression. And this is uh, where our organization steps in and what we also uh, yeah, aim at with our work. We want to empower the users so that they can persist in the public debate and that uh, they don't have to withdraw uh, from it. We are the first point of contact. We help with a consultation in emergency situations, but also in long-term planning and in long-term strategy um, because m many of our clients do not only have one incident and then uh, it's done. They come back all the time and also um, yeah, online violence spreads very fast and we almost never deal with only one incident at a time. We support uh, with law enforcement and litigation so the people can defend themselves. And of course, we want to deter the perpetrators. Uh, we also have a cooperation with a specialized cybercrime unit um, here in, um, in the prosecution in Germany that uh, yeah, is very, very helpful uh, because civil society has to play a very important role in bringing the cases and building trust in the community in these, um, in these um, public institutions. We also communicate our successes um, to show that it's worth it. And of course, also to deter the perpetrators, but to empower the victims um, with communicated and that some other people have been successful is a very, very powerful tool. And we also sensitize law enforcement, judiciary and politics uh, for the needs of the victims, uh, which is also a very important part of our work because due to yeah, inactivity in the last uh, few years, there is a lot of trust um, lost and we see ourselves as, as the bridge between the victims and the public institutions here. And we also influence the legislation to improve um, the protection and the overall circumstances. And I can tell you with regards to the discussion later that platform responsibility and platform liability of big tech companies is a very, very important uh, part of this work. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Josephine. We're going to move swiftly on now to Russia from Amnesty International, Russia. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank, thank you, Paul, for having me on this panel. Um, just a, a quick intro into um, Amnesty Tech, uh, which is the program that I'm the director of. Amnesty Tech is a multidisciplinary team of technologists, human rights researchers, lawyers, advocates, and we're working to ensure that advancements in technology is protect rather than undermine human rights. Now, today I'm going to talk about um, a trend that we've that we've seen and um, that we launched an investigation on in partnership with um, many journalists in, in the summer called the Pegasus Project. Um, and that's the trend of unlawful targeted surveillance. Um, before I delve into the Pegasus Project, I just want to contextualize the work that we have done on this issue. 
So over the years, Amnesty International, as well as many other NGOs, researchers, academics, um, have noticed that there's a, a pervasive lack of transparency around the use of uh, targeted digital surveillance and the role of the private sector in facilitating that surveillance. And what that, what that has done is it's impeded um, an understanding of and indeed accountability for the severe human rights impacts that we've seen of this cyber surveillance trade. And we've long cautioned that um, a few hard-won insights that we have gained um, regarding, for example, NSO Group and a, and a handful of other uh, cyber surveillance companies such as Hacking Team and Finn Fisher were really just um, the tip of the iceberg. And so in July, we launched a collaborative investigation uh, which involved 80 journalists from 17 uh, media organizations in 10 countries, which was coordinated by Forbidden Stories, which is a Paris-based uh, media NGO. And Amnesty International, so our Amnesty Tech Security Lab, uh, which is based in Berlin and comprises technologists who carry out forensic investigations um, into unlawful targeted attacks. Um, we were the technical partner in this investigation. And what this investigation did um, was shed light on just how states' use of targeted digital surveillance tools, in this case specifically Pegasus, which is supplied by one of the industry's most prominent companies, which is Israeli company NSO Group, is utterly out of control. Um, it is threatening individuals' human rights, including their physical safety on a systematic level, and it also is destabilizing to national security. Now, just very quickly onto Pegasus spyware. By nature, it's designed to go undetected, um, and it's considered one of the world's most intrusive commercially available surveillance tools. Now, when this tool is installed on your device, so on your phone, for example, it allows an attacker complete access to the device's messages, emails, camera, media, microphone, calls, contacts, so, so basically into the target's entire life. Now, what this investigation uncovered was that um, human rights defenders, lawyers, activists, uh, journalists, politicians across the globe um, were potentially targeted with this spyware. Uh, and to talk a little bit about figures, uh, this is over 200 journalists from at least 20 countries, hundreds of politicians, uh, including 14 heads of state. Um, and what that really shows is that it doesn't matter whether you're a, a journalist expressing criticism against your government, um, it doesn't matter whether you're the head of that government, nobody is safe from the reach of this spyware. Anybody can be targeted. And um, I won't go into too much detail on, on examples because I know that we have limited time, but just to mention a few, um, there was a case of a journalist in Mexico who was um, selected for targeting with spyware just weeks before his killing in 2018. More than 40 Azerbaijani journalists. Um, in India, at least 40 journalists were targeted with the spyware. The investigation identified journalists working in major um, news outlets, including Associated Press, CNN, New York Times, and others. And even post the launch of our uh, project in, in July, uh, more and more cases have been emerging. So we're still getting many, many reports of um, people's phones being uh, targeted and, and successfully compromised with Pegasus spyware. Um, human rights defenders in Palestine. Uh, just yesterday, we published an investigation into the targeting of four uh, human rights defenders in Kazakhstan uh, and also um, Last week, Reuters published an investigation into the targeting of nine U.S. State Department employees. Um, to talk quickly about, you know, in view of the systematic um, targeting of, of civil society using this spyware, I just want to touch on the, the real life impacts that, that it has had on, on the people who've been targeted, um, whether or not they were successfully compromised. So obviously the right to privacy is, is engaged here and, and you know, we describe this as a global assault on, on the right to privacy. But it's also important to remember that it's not just about the right to privacy. Um, and what the investigation and the stories that were uncovered um, illustrate is, is a really disturbing link between targeted digital surveillance, privacy abuses, and then other human rights abuses. Now, of course, um, Freedom of speech is a key one, um, which was violated. You know, journalists, human rights defenders and others targeted with the spyware. The right to life, the right to security of person, the huge psychological impact that this has on people. 
And it's important to remember that the mere threat of, of surveillance, it doesn't matter whether or not you're actually successfully um, surveilled, that the mere threat that you may be also has a massive um, chilling and silencing effect and it really contributes to the overall shrinking of the, of the civic space. Um, now, just to sort of wrap up and, and talk about some of the, the recommendations that we're making in view of these uh, really important findings. What the investigation showed is that NSO group spyware is really the weapon of choice um, against uh, civil society for, for governments. And it's been used to attack and silence journalists, activists and, and others around the world and, and essentially to, to, to crush dissent. Um, what this also shows is that it's, it's an incredibly unaccountable industry, as well as an unaccountable sphere of state, state practice that needs to be regulated meaningfully. We have a huge gap in international regulation regarding the export of these types of technologies. And this shows why it's so important that um, states do meaningfully um, regulate this industry in line with, with human rights. Um, and so one of the, the things that we, we've been calling for is, is obviously regulation of state practice um, over the use of, of these um, surveillance tools and, and over the practice of, of, of surveillance, but also um, uh, regulation on an international level to govern the export of uh, these technologies. And I'd be very happy to expand more on, on some of the issues that I've raised in the discussion. Thank you very much. Russell, thank you very much. Um, yes, I mean, that's we could that's a, we could have a, a five hour discussion about about that. I'm sure, and and hopefully we'll get to some of it. Although uh, time permitting, so we have a group of discussants: uh, Barton and Stacia and Latha and Catherine and Liesel. I'm going to ask you. I know that you may well have points that you specifically want to make, and that is fine. But I'm going to ask you uh, to talk to two specific questions um, for a reasonably brief period of time, so that we can generate a discussion. And we're also going to take some questions from from the, the floor. I'm, I'm going to go to you in a particular order. But the questions are: uh, How should we move forward with refining and implementing cyber norms? That, that was a clear uh, takeaway from the prep session. And the second one is, how will we know that the mechanisms that we've put in place to deal with cybercrime are working, are satisfactory? In other words, what does success look like? Um, I've been around for a very long time. Pre-internet uh, crime, general crime, has always been a problem. That It's never solved. Uh, we seem to think, sometimes I think we think we're going to be able to solve cybercrime in a, in a different way to the way that we solve crime. So I'm very interested in your views on, in your views on that. And, and uh, once we've heard from our discussants, I'm happy for others to come in as well. And we will take questions from the floor. I acknowledge there have been a couple. I'm going to go first to Latha, uh, if that's all right with you, Latha, uh, and uh, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Chris. I I take your point that you want us to concentrate on how do we move on norms uh, was one of the first questions you raised. And uh, what I want to say is the UN efforts, the efforts we've, the whole world has made in the UN are very commendable. Uh, whether it's the UN GGE sessions that have stuck at it year after year, whether it's the open-ended working group, whether it's the high-level panel set up by the Secretary General, whether it's the roadmap, the UN has done a great deal to put this issue center stage, you know, that we do need norms, that we do need some kind of regulation of the uh, internet. Uh, why have we not really been able to come up with binding norms which have consequences? Uh, is the question, you know, because all along the discussion has been about voluntary norms. But I think if we are to address the question of attribution, of accountability, and of consequences to be faced by offenders, uh, without these elements, I think simply voluntary non-binding norms are not going to fit the ticket. I think this is the basic uh, handicap that we've been facing on uh, norms. Now, I personally think that the IGF or the IGF plus 
uh, the platform on which we're speaking today, the IGF, is perhaps a more promising area because the IGF has made uh, more efforts to bring in government representation. The, the MAG has certainly been strengthened. And the parliamentary delegations, I think, were a very important development. The last IGF I attended in person, which was uh, two years ago, uh, we certainly had many members of parliament there from several countries, but not enough. But I think that if that school of thought could be followed, that would be a genuine multi-stakeholder forum, which I think is very, very important because if you don't bring in all the stakeholders, this is always going to remain a problem. How do we measure success? Uh, I would say if we have norms that work, we will achieve some measure of success. So I think it would be putting the cart before the horse to say, let's define parameters of uh, uh, success before we see how we can move forward on uh, norms. I'm, I'd also like to talk about other efforts in this. I was very interested to hear what Hate Aid, Amnesty and others had to say about how they help victims. Uh, there are many other groups who are doing very commendable uh, work. Uh, and of course, we all know what is happening on uh, social media these days. But since you asked us to limit our opening remarks to two minutes, Chris, I'm in your hands and I'll stop now, but I hope I can come back to some of these points uh, in the later discussion. Latter. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. As you know, in these sessions, time management is a, is a tough job. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if perhaps we could turn our minds to updating our expression cart before the horse, which seems to be a very pre-internet expression, and maybe we could come up with something that might be more uh, more relevant to the internet in the future. Um, let's go to uh, let's go to Bart. Um, Bart, over to you. Hello. Good morning. Uh, at least it's morning in the Hague. Um, as European Parliament's chief negotiator on the new cybersecurity legislation that will come out in the next couple of years. I'm very busy negotiating at this moment, but what we're trying to do is basically um, create resilience in the entities that we want to protect. So we're hitting our cybersecurity posture. And later uh, next year, the European Commission will come with, so that's with entities. The later um, the European Commission will come with proposals regarding products or connected devices smart devices, but also hard and software products. So those are the two main efforts that Europe is doing to keep us safe. But to, to, to come back to your question, Chris, it's very important that we do not just look at the, 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 the uh, hiding the barriers and making sure that we don't get hacked. It's also good to look at who is exploiting these favorable conditions, who is behind it, why. So what Europe is also doing is creating a cyber toolbox for sanction regimes. We've extended that also to say something about Josephine's great story to hybrid toolbox, which could respond to below the threshold threats, how we call them, like cyber sabotage, cyber espionage, but also against election interference, economic coercion. Europe is becoming more and more normative in uh, the global space. And that is, to answer your question, uh, how do you make norms? It's also by upholding it. What I am appalled by is by many government leaders around the world saying, well, this is a tweet me saying our uh, government of X, Y, or Z condemns this horrible uh, cyber attack and then doing nothing. That is, in fact, communicating that there should be a norm, but not doing anything means there is no norm for the perpetrator. And that is what I'm, uh, I think that we're in a phase of actually communicating norms here. And how do you communicate norms? Well, Europe is in the uh, process of of, of making new instruments, using agriculture, using migration visa, using sanction regimes, using access to the internal market. We are becoming more and more of a geopolitical player, and I very much encourage that. We shouldn't just heighten our security posture. We should also do something about the perpetrators behind it. A geopolitical order has to be upheld. Now, that's my two minutes for now. Back later. Back to you, Chris.
And it would be great, Chris, if you could I, I unmute shall, I, I shall unmute. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's the first time I've done it, to be fair. Um, yes, I, I was going to throw a question in, if we had time, you've, which you've kind of addressed, but I'm going to just sort of regurgitate it, which is what I've written down here. It's how can we have an open and honest multi-stakeholder, how can we have an open and honest multi-stakeholder collaboration on cybercrime when some state actors are not are contributing disingenuously, which is kind of what you've just what you've just said. And I wasn't sure whether it was it was too controversial to throw in, but now that you've mentioned it, I'm I'm going to put it out there and see if anybody wants to respond later on. Um, but thank you, thank you very much for that. Let's go to Anastasia. Anastasia, over to you. Hello to everyone, and thank you so much for providing the floor. We've been participating at the GF for the second time as there is a teams from Kaspersky, uh, unfortunately, on the virtual format. Hopefully, physically, it will be also possible because we heard lots of the really good and experience from the building community building uh, through different days of the IGF. Um, also, focusing on the key questions about the refining and implementing cyber norms, um, I would say that implementation certainly does happen already and in different parts of the world and across different sectors. Um, the question is, do we have a sufficient knowledge about how they've been implemented currently and what challenges particularly arise across different um, developing, developing countries, um, more capable private sector and a less capable, including small and medium businesses and all the other also now state actors in civil society and further. So I guess this is a key question, how could we learn more? What should be done to um, support those who need it with the norm implementation and what good practices could be shared with each other? Um, as in one of the key practical examples within the best practice forum, which Tal mentioned, we also looked into how particular security incidents have triggered the norm development, norm implementation. It was really truly international research that we did. Um, I was personally working with a hard blade vulnerability case, and I, I needed to conduct the interview of the different security researchers based in the US, um, in Europe, um, and in Russia as well. And the key question from my side was. Did you know about the particular cyber norms, um, specifically the norm on responsible reporting vulnerabilities to implement this? And of course, the question was no. But does it mean that actually the security researchers didn't follow really good practices of the coordinated responsible vulnerability disclosure? Of course, no, they did. Um, they just didn't know about what actually states are doing within the UN. And there's definitely here's a some gap. And the IGF, I think it's one of the key places to close the gap, to make sure that those um, the work of the security researchers, of the incident responders, of the diplomats, of the academia NGOs could be less uh, happening in silos. Um, about the implementation as well, uh, throughout the, the last week of the IGF, definitely there have been lots of the really good workshops. We particularly conducted the workshop on the helping to understand how the norms of the critical infrastructure protection are happening and how the integrity of supply chains also could be ensured. There have been also really interesting workshops about uh, learning how the digital security of products is happening, looking at the normative practices and regulatory practices coming from the US. US does a lot of great initiatives in this regard today in the European Union, where it also mentioned we all, I think, uh, looking closely what's happening with the NIS directive and what will happen next year with the security of products and the European cybersecurity certification. Um, it was also great to, to hear the views from coming from the Asia Pacific, but I think we need more and more diverse views to learn it what actually um, challenges again might happen down. And the last point probably from my side, we also wanted to make some practical exercises because I believe that IGF needs more and more workshops to practically help raise cybersecurity talent and help actually to do more practical capacity building exercises. So we tried again, unfortunately in a virtual forum, but we did organize the uh, game for non-techers to learn the complexities of the technical attribution together with Diplo Foundation. That was um, really an interesting experience, a lot to learn how to improve the user experience again, given that we all located virtually in different parts of the world. But thank you so much for this opportunity. And again, I'd like to highlight the IGF is one of the great spaces to connect the dots of the different communities. Thank you. Anastasia, thank you very much. Um, Let's go now to Catherine. Catherine, over to you. You're on mute, Catherine. You're on mute. 
Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chris. And I'm not going to say last and not least because uh, it is the position of Africa that we are always questioned uh, last. You're not actually. You're not actually last. There's <laughs> there's Liesl to follow. There's Liesl to follow you. I left the U.S. till the last. Never make mind. A political statement. Okay. So. Um, uh, I agree very much with Lada that maybe the reason why the norms have not had impact is um, the critical questions of accountability. And of course, there there's a technical problem of um, attribution. And then the issue which is very important to developing countries, which is about redress, reparation and repair. And I was very impressed with uh, Josephine's work in uh, Hate AIDS because I think there are many places where the impact on the individual is not really uh, addressed in any comprehensive way. Uh, but you can carry that up even to countries that uh, even if the perpetrator is caught, if critical infrastructure built at great expense has been destroyed, um, countries have been reluctant to commit themselves to uh, provide uh, any type of uh, redress uh, unless on a voluntary basis. Now, I'd say we have to go deeper, uh, and that is we now have a global infrastructure with very complex applications, which are political, social, financial, and of many other types and which involve individuals as well as organizations and governments. And I think uh, this has created a cultural misfit because never before in the history in the world have we had to develop a culture that encompasses uh, such complexity on a global scale. Now that may sound very theoretical, but I think those are some of the questions which in a multi-stakeholder fashion we need to discuss if we are going to have effective um, solutions um, which have impact. Uh, I would say we have two approaches because I think uh, there isn't much time left. Uh, one is that uh, there is a culture that will evolve, but that happens very slowly, but it will be helped by dialogue at IGF and other forums uh, so that we all listen to each other and to our solutions. But there's also the solutions uh, which are coming very well from a region uh, such as uh, Europe or the Asia Pacific, where they're able to design and test solutions. And there, the important approach is the information sharing so that other regions can also learn from that approach, which I hope will produce results uh, much faster than the evolutionary approach where we just recognize uh, that there's an issue and we hope that solutions will emerge with time, which of course they will, which is why human beings have survived this long. So I'll stop there, but uh, I'm listening carefully to the discussion and I'll be very glad to engage as we go on. Thank you, Catherine, um, appreciate it. Liesl. Oh, thank you, Chris. And uh, this has been a really rich discussion, um, not just in this panel, but certainly over the course of the week. And it was great to hear the um, summary from the preparatory session, which I think put a lot of um, fodder for uh, the presentations. Um, to answer your first question, um, I would say that, um, you know, we. <laughs> In, I think as somewhat of a surprise to some, including possibly the United States and Russia, we were able to come to consensus on the norms uh, on the GGE report and the OEWG report this year. Um, and it not only um, affirmed the norms and frankly the, the broader aspects of the framework for responsible state behavior like the applicability of existing international law to cyberspace and um, confidence building measures. But um, countries also committed to, um, to work with others to, uh, to implement the norms and ex 
express how they how countries do it themselves and how they can do it with other countries and also in, with other stakeholders around the world so that commitment is also a sort of a, a step ahead a step a step forward to uh, I suppose refining in in defining uh, the the norms themselves how to adopt and adhere to them and um, how to implement them uh, in your own um, in your own uh, national context. Um, so as we move forward, I think that's a very positive step in that consensus that we built is one, dis despite all of the trends of challenges that people have mentioned and they are not, um, they are not uh, to, be, to be belittled, but one trend, positive trend, is uh, the consensus that emerged out of those two reports um, and going forward, I think. Uh, capacity building is a huge component of that, and, uh, and uh, the United States is committed to doing that in many ways and working with other countries and organizations like the Global Forum for Cyber Expertise. Um, to answer your second question, well, <laughs> I don't know if, uh, you know, we used to say that security is a destination. <laughs> it's not a destination, it's a journey. Um, and I think that's probably going to be true for many things. But I think there are um, indicators or benchmarks that we can point to, uh, we could point to, to um, be able to say if we have uh, more, more trust than we did or we know it's more satisfactory than it was. One would be, of course, if countries could, uh, if they haven't, if they take efforts to build up their uh, laws around crime um, and then the, uh, the use of cyber-enabled crime uh, to be included in that, and as such, um, take efforts to, I think somebody said, an investing in um, in the law enforcement community to actually prosecute and um, investigate and prosecute those crimes. Um, so, that, uh, so that is one thing. Um, I think from a uh, behavioral standpoint, if we see changes in methods and behavior um, in, the, in the criminal community online, that's, that's one indication that things are working. One thing that we, um, I do think that even though, you know, with, uh, I think Latha makes some very good points about how to uh, know if the norms are working. Um, and while they are non-binding, they are also, um, they, and they're not self-enforcing. So we as a community have to step up and figure out ways to, uh, to, to raise the cost to malicious actors uh, to undertake malicious behavior in cyberspace and impose consequences that, uh, that uh, um, is sort of an enforcement mechanism in itself. The United States and many other countries have, have uh, called out countries when we see the, their malicious activity in cyberspace. And there are other um, things that we can do, uh, such as sanctions or other, uh, other things that uh, increase the cost for that kind of behavior, whether it's criminal or uh, state activity. I know that um, there's a lot to cover <laughs> in this. Uh, so complexity and... Uh, uh, convergence and collaboration are all uh, good C-word trends. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Liesl. Thank you very much. Lather, I can see your hand. I'll get you in one second. Um, we're going to go to questions in the second, uh, once we've heard from Lather, uh, and uh, questions are on the chat, and also questions from the room. Uh, so, Lather, over to you briefly, and then we'll go to questions. No, I just wanted to say, you know, that there was a question for me, actually, which I was responding to from yes. Wolfgang Kleinwachter, my good friend uh, at the IGF. And uh, he asked what these consequences could be that I talked about, you know, when I said that people should face consequences for violating now norms. I'd say you'd have to have a different set of consequences for states and for non-state actors. Secondly, I'd say you have to have a ranking for the severity of the violation, you know, to say, is it moderate, is it severe, is it catastrophic, etc. 
Uh, and then you'd have to have a list of responses. And as I said, there would have to be a separate issue for states and a separate issue for non-state actors. For example, a non-state actor could face criminal charges. You could put him on an Interpol red corner notice list. You know, you could uh, prevent his travel. You could freeze his assets. You know, the things we traditionally do to criminals. Obviously, with the states, it's much more complicated. Rather than name and shame, I would say name and negotiate before you get to the stage of, uh, of, of shame. So uh, that, that was really what I wanted to say about this. And I also wanted to mention uh, other efforts or norms, such as the uh, Paris Peace Call and uh, you know uh, our own work at the Global Commission on Internet Governance and the Global Co uh, you know, Commission on uh, the Stability of Cyberspace. Time permitting, I'd like to get to that as well, because I think these efforts can reinforce what's happening in the, uh, in the UN and in the IGF. But for now, I'll stop with this because I thought I'd um, answer the specific question put by, uh, put by, uh, by Wolfgang. Thank uh, you. Wolfgang. Lata, thank you. That's very much appreciated. And that's exactly why we're here to deal with those specific questions. I've got a queue of people who, um, who, want, who want to speak. I'm going to get to you in one second before I do that. Let me just throw quickly to Lucien, who's in the room. Lucien, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, I would like to remember in the room, if you have any questions, please raise your hand and we have someone that will give you the floor. N'hésitez pas à poser une question et à lever la main si besoin. I have uh, two people asking. Let, let me, I'll come back to you in a second, Lucien, to take those questions. I've, got a, I've got a, also got a question in the chat, but I'm going to go to our discussants first. Uh, Craig, then Liesl, then Anastasia. Craig, over to you. Yeah, thanks very much. I was just going to come back to uh, Laffer's point about um, where we take the actions. One of the ways we're looking at the model now in the crime is, is to prosecute where the actors are actually based. So taking the evidence from a, an, a, a one country and then identification of the threat actors uh, or non-state actors in another country and then prosecuting directly in that country rather than have to go down the extradition line and things like that. That's still a useful tool, but effectively then that gets the law enforcement community in the countries working, cooperating more effectively. Um, one of the projects we have currently at the moment in Africa is doing exactly that. We have an Africa Joint Operations Against Cybercrime Desk funded by the United Kingdom, um, and that now has a team in the ground doing that sort of work. And on our website, there's details of that. But again, it's, it's trying to change that, that model of policing effectively so you don't do it with one hand tied behind your back. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I do want to get to questions, so I'm going to ask our discussants to, I'm not going to stop you speaking, but if you could be brief, that would be fantastic. Lisa, you're next. Thank you, Chris. Maybe just a two-finger. Um, on the, um, uh, Latha's good point about naming and shaming should be naming and negotiating. I actually think that um, there should be, that you know, coming from uh, the State Department, you know, we think that, uh, the, we don't think that the, this is something without diplomacy, right? So there's lots of conversation. We've built a framework that stands, that the, the negotiation before uh, the naming um, and so we have a foundation from which to, uh, to, to which to point uh, to say that this is what the res responsible behavior is. So it shouldn't be necessarily a surprise. Um, but also um, there are many aspects of that kind of framework that, that require and, um, and welcome diplomacy as well. So negotiation, but also discussion. <laughs> Thank you. Super, thank you. Let's go to a question in the room, then we'll come back to our, uh, I'm following the queue I've got in front of me. So, Lucien, the first person in the room, please. Yeah. Thank you very much. Cory Doctor from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Thank you for that excellent presentation. Um, I heard a lot about uh, vulnerabilities and security, but I kept waiting for someone to talk about extraordinary access and lawful interception, as well as the whole hoarding of zero days by intelligence agencies and the roles that governments play in systematically undermining the security of the services we all rely on. Could some of the panelists comment on that, please? That is a, a good question. Um, I'm gonna ask if anybody wants to comment on it before I go back to the queue. 
Uh, open up your microphone and speak if you do. I'm not getting, I'm not feeling the love that anybody wants to comment at this stage. So let's take that under advisement and, well, and move look, back to it. Chris, if, if, okay, please, yes, please, go ahead, it's, good, yes, it's a good question, right? It's, yep. it's, 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 um, so the zero day factories that we see around the world are somewhat privatized. That's for the NSO group, for example, that has been briefed on by uh, Amnesty International and some, some of it is in government hands. Um, there are a couple of worrying trends. The first of this is, listen, the Chinese have stopped um, looking for zero days in international contests um, with uh, coordinated vulnerability disclosure uh, following. They said no Chinese can compete. We do our own uh, CTFs in China and you give uh, zero days to the Chinese government first before you disclose it to the vendors. That's very problematic. Um, I think that there should be an international diplomatic effort to address this. If you combine that capability with the huge effort that China is taking for intellectual property theft and otherwise cyber operations, it's not the best prospect for the world in the digital security that we face. Secondly, if you look at Pegasus, it's extremely problematic that the Israeli company NSO would export that to uh, countries like Hungary or Poland, etc., and other uh, in Saudi Arabia. But let me also address that if every country would go after these zero days to hack uh, legitimate targets, that would not be beneficial for the internet either, would it be? Um, so we have to find a balance there. And I think that it's all around export controls, like Amnesty also said. It's about the Vassana arrangement that the countries have to sign up to. And diplomatic pressure, like the State Department just said, is key. So we can't ignore the fact that we sometimes need um, zero days to get to endpoints, to legitimate targets. And also the Interpol director would agree that sometimes you have a severe criminal and you want to get into that communication. Sometimes you can't get into that communication without zero days. So you can't exclude it. But what you can do is regulate the export, more oversight, better democratic standards. And that's what we have to do together. And especially with the diplomats here, I think that we, will, we could, if we would just have the political will. And we from Europe, we have that will. And back to you. But thank you. Anastasia, you want to comment? Then I'm going to go to the question from DACA. Anastasia, go ahead. Thank you so much. I would like probably to complement and thus present the perspective of the industry to what Bart said about the um, the Chinese rules and probably the any future rule that the government might follow here as well, tackling the use of the zero-day vulnerabilities and answering that the question, I think, we do have, um, as a global community, the norm on responsible reporting vulnerability, but we actually, it's uh, well, honestly saying it really sounds general and more specificity would actually be, be uh, necessary in this regard, particularly to, if it's possible, to somehow harmonize the approaches of the government to the vulnerability treatment overall and to increase the transparency on the vulnerability stockpiling, vulnerability used by both states and non-state actors. I think it will be really important to implement keeping in mind that still the technology that we use remains global, the technology that we consume, distribute, remains global, and the harmonizations on the rules across the governments, how the vulnerabilities are being treated, it's one of the key actually to make sure that the industry would not be actually um, torn between different rules and thus will contradict to the rules of the one country um, while following the rules of the other countries in reporting the vulnerabilities. And the other aspect I also wanted to mention here, I would uh, agree in align with the comments said before by Director Jones about the cybercrime and the more capacities and the more, uh, uh, sorry, focus on the law enforcement capacity building. And certainly we know that the cybercrime and the um, international uh, responsible state behavior are two different processes within the first and the third committee. For industry, for the police, it might actually be very close topics, but those are a separate process. And of course, the content and the expertise is important, but it's also important to make sure that the process is clear, that the process is aligned. And if it is somehow, somehow will be possible to m ensure that the first and the third committee processes will be aligned, I think it would be also really important key to further success in this regard. Thank you. Thank you, Anastasia. We're going to go to the remote hub in Dakar. Then we're going to go to, to with the question in the room. We're going to pick up those two questions and we're going to get responses. Uh, Josephine and Catherine, I know that you want to speak. I'll, I will get to you. Dakar, over to you. Uh, thank you so much for allowing Dhaka Bangladesh remote hub 
to ask the question and moreover dhaka uh, bangladesh internet governance forum is so grateful to be a part of this igf 2021 forum we get lots of information from this igf uh, so our question is we know that young generations are more uh, vulnerable part of cyber space world how can internet governance work for saving them by building a data layer on social media or websites spatial how can internet governance forum work with those companies who provide this type of service thank you so much thank you very much dakar we've got that question written down here and, and and any of our panelists who want to speak to it will be able to do so once we've taken the other question from the floor and then we're going to go to each of our panelists in turn to make some remarks go ahead hello um, lucian my name is uh, Dr. Haru Al Hassan um, from Nigeria. My question is that um, I need an explanation from experts. How can nations mitigate cyber threats sponsored by state actors? Uh, as we are aware that some countries are training cyber militants uh, for launching attacks on other nations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I think we have to some degree addressed that in the comments that we've made, but I'll, we'll pick it up as we go through uh, our, our, uh, our speakers. Um, Josephine? Thank you. Um, yeah, I can also pick up the first uh, question because it's related to yeah. what I wanted to say anyways. Um, yeah, um, I would really appreciate um, such an attempt to also come together with the big tech companies um, on this topic on an international um, level here, because we have to be aware that oftentimes accountability, but also all kinds of law enforcement uh, really end at the national borders. This is something that we have to be aware of. And this does even happen within Europe. So it's even harder to find a global solution here. And we have to just be aware that these companies are located abroad and delivering their services uh, to, all, to the whole world. Um, and that's uh, something that really needs to be addressed because uh, I think we've seen also that the time for self-regulation uh, is, is somehow over because it just did not work. There were many attempts of making, uh, making the industry self-regulating uh, them. And this is just uh, something um, yeah, that brought, it, it brought us to the situation where we are in now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Catherine. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, I can address Dr. Tari's question as well as uh, 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 just commenting on Somalia. Um, Yes, I think the UNGG efforts at the UN and the open-ended working group are very much trying to address the state-to-state -state, uh, issue uh, in terms of the, the, you know, the, the kind of impacts that uh, states can get, whether they either weaponize the technology or uh, they engage in other activities. So this was, is dealt with in four areas, at least. Um, there are the norms, which uh, tell us uh, the basic uh, infrastructure institutions and practices that should be uh, in place. There's international law, which uh, hopefully gives a place to go uh, when there is uh, such a state-to-state -state conflict and um, there is an aggrieved party. Uh, there's the issue of confidence building measures, which help us to reduce the tension that between states that occurs uh, when uh, such incidents are either threatened or they take place. And there are also the capacity building measures, which should be done in a globally cooperative way, because there's the principle of the weakest link, that if there are some countries who are not able to appreciate this technology, then um, they are in a better place to be misused uh, by uh, bad actors. The last point I want to address is just uh, on the question from the colleague from Dhaka. Uh, and this is, I think, something which needs to be a very uh, important subject of uh, discussion at the IGF and other forums, which is 
the fact that uh, there's a high payoff for crime and bad behavior on the internet, despite our efforts, both at the local and the international level. Um, there are too few of the criminals, whether they're individuals or whether it's states behaving badly, uh, that actually uh, suffer for their actions. And when this is combined with the diminishing opportunities for youth in developing countries, um, you have an explosive mixture because many of them are going to choose the internet as a place to perform crime. So I think as we think about all the other I think we're um, we've lost. I think we've lost Catherine. I'm assuming you guys can hear me. So, on the assumption that you can, we seem to have lost uh, Catherine. So, let's uh, thank you, Catherine. Oh, you're 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 shaking and um, and uh, and we can't hear you. Um, no, I'm done. I I'm done. Okay, thank you, Catherine. You're very kind. Thank you. Okay, we have literally got four minutes left, so we don't really have time for what I would like to have done, which is to bring everybody around to, 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 to closing remarks. Um, I will, however, uh, rather than waste everyone's time by me uh, attempting to sum up, which is probably not particularly useful at this stage, uh, just throw open the, the to our to our panelists for any thirty second last minute remarks. If anybody wants to make them, put your hand up. If you do, I will happily give you the floor. If you'd like to say something to close, um, I do know that uh, unless I'm very much mistaken, I think that Russia wanted to address briefly the uh, the, the question on youth. So, Russia, why don't you take that? Well, thank you very much. Just just wanted to say that um, actually Amnesty International will be launching a, a long term uh, program of work on children's digital rights commencing in January next year. And as part of that project, um, we see several things that can be done in order to protect children and young people online and, and to enable them to, to use such an incredible space which can facilitate their rights as well as um, undermine them. And I think one of the key things that um, we're seeking to do is, is really have um, children and young people be part of the conversation, be part of the standard setting. You know, the internet was not designed with children and young people in mind. Certainly, you know, social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter and whatever, um, the, the many other platforms were, were not designed for them in, in mind. And so we see them as a, as a crit critical part of um, regulating the online space so that it works for them. And we also see youth-led research, youth-led campaigning as, as, as a major component to, to also coming up with the policy solutions that would, would protect them online. And just in terms of very, very final remarks, um, I was really interested to hear the, the answer about the, um, the, the risk of state-on-state of -state, um, cyber attacks. And just wanted to, to point out another trend that, that we're seeing, which is um, hacker-for-hire attacks. So th what, what this means is um, states contracting with, with companies that then launch cyber attacks against other states um, as, as a sort of conduit. Again, um, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, I really do think that regulation at the international level of private cyber surveillance companies is desperately needed, as well as international regulation where it's lacking to, to regulate the state practice of the use of these tools. Thank you. Thank you, Russia. Bart, you've got 30 seconds, 40 at a pinch. 30 seconds. First of all, we have amended on eight different occasions to, um, to, to forbid large-scale platforms to follow children. Extremely important. In Europe, we will legislate. And in the, in the, in the current negotiations, that's still in. So, Rasa, full on, spot on. The last remark. On everything going on on the internet with new norms, we should be, uh, make sure that the baseline is clear. A free and open internet, we should not touch the core of the internet. There's more and more discussion touching root level DNS servers, also in Europe. And I will do everything in my power to make sure that we do not touch and regulate the core of the internet because otherwise 
all of the other legislation that we do will be of no avail. So that's my last remark. Back to you. Thank you very much. We need to close. It's the time. Everyone's been fantastic. I thank you all very much indeed for your time. Thanks everyone for contributing. Very much appreciated. See you all soon. Bye everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone. Goodbye.